greetings on this random planet called Earth and welcome to my channel. My name is Zelda and I mainly make fashion content. However, for today's video I am back with part 2 of how to score a 7 on your biology IA. If you haven't watched part 1 I would recommend you go and jump over there and watch that first because this is just the one that follows so it makes logical sense. So if you're here let's just jump right into this video because you know what's going on. After your raw data table, you need your qualitative data. As the IV puts it, their impact will depend upon the nature of your investigation. For example, fieldwork should always have a site description which could take the form of maps, sketches, or photographs with annotations. A number of examiners commented on the fact that qualitative observations had frequently been ignored. So don't ignore them, guys. In summary, qualitative data are basically observations that are relevant and are not quantitative. For example, if you notice a color change or you realized one of your test tubes had something strange in it, you may want to note that down. The key here is just that it should be relevant. If that strange thing in your test tube did not result in your trial becoming an outlier, it may not be worth noting it down. Generally, bullet points are probably the easiest, but I think you could also do it in a little text, but honestly, I'm not really sure about that. An incredibly important thing to mention in this section is also any increases in uncertainty and a short explanation as to why you increase the uncertainty. For biology IAs, it is unlikely that you will have many increases in uncertainty. However, things like human rate of reaction should be increased and the increase has to be justified. This justification in most cases is fairly easy though since you just need to say what the flaw in the initial measurement was. For example, you increase the uncertainty of the water bath temperature because you notice small fluctuations in the water bath that exceeded the standard uncertainty of plus or minus 0.1 degrees celsius or whatever the issue was. Note that for biology you do not have to derive your uncertainties. Unlike in chemistry and physics, it is fine to simply add up your uncertainties of the individual apparatus used to obtain an overall uncertainty as shown here. Moving on to the process data table, this table basically includes your data after calculations. So up until now, you should not have presented any data with calculations, but only the exact results you measured. Again, you want your independent variable on your y-axis and the dependent variable on the x-axis. Because my uncertainties changed a lot due to my methodology as aforementioned, I created a separate table and footnoted that you should see uncertainties in that table. In most cases, this will not be the best method though. Here you also include your standard deviation, though some people like to include it in the raw data table and and the IB hasn't, to my knowledge, commented that this is a bad thing, I would generally recommend that you include it in the process data, since in terms of communications, it makes more sense here, at least to me it does, because it's a way of processing your data, so it makes more sense to me here. Um, but yeah, as said, I don't know what the IB actually thinks about this. Note that you can't have standard deviations if you have less than five pieces of data. For example, if you have five trials for the 10% concentration and one of those trials is an outlier, you can't exclude that outlier and calculate a standard deviation, which is why I would definitely recommend that at the bare minimum you do a six times six trial. And ideally to demonstrate personal engagement a little more, you want to do something like a six times seven or a seven times seven or a six times eight trial. Moving on to sample calculations. Next, you take one of your trials and do a sample calculation. Here you go through step by step and explain how you obtain your process data, first in word format and then mathematically. You have to do both or you will lose marks. I personally like this table format a friend of mine showed me because it is quite easy to follow, however it consumes a lot of space. So if you are desperate for space, it may be easier to simply write the explanation and a calculation in a regular paragraph format. Either way, you should present the general equation on the side and define the variables and then go through step by step. One thing to watch out for is that you use the correct standard deviation because there are two different types, but otherwise this is quite self-explanatory I find. Following the calculations, you need a graph. This graph should exclusively present process data. You should not include raw data on any of your graphs unless you collected your data with data logging, in which case your raw data may be presented through a graph. If your data is continuous, that would be things like increasing temperatures or concentrations, you have to use a scatter plot. If your data is not continuous or discontinuous, for example, you're comparing different types of enzymes or different situations citrus fruits, you use a bar chart. Whatever your graph is, you should have your independent variable on the x-axis and the dependent variable on the y-axis. As you can see here, my independent variable was lemon juice concentration or LJC and my dependent variable was mean E. coli inhibition zone, which as I'm noticing now should have been mean E. coli growth inhibition zone. Um, but in any case, you can see that is my process data. Again, both axes have to include your units and, in theory, uncertainty. Note again that due to my methodology, my uncertainty was not included for the lemon juice concentrations, but 
you likely should mention it. By convention, you separate your units with a slash. However, some people prefer simply placing the units in brackets. In the grand scheme of things, I don't really think it makes a huge difference, but it is worth noting. In terms of the axes themselves, make sure that you have uniform increments. For example, don't go from 0 to 20 to 40 to 50 percent concentrations. Just stay consistent with your steps. You should also adjust those increments to fit your data. Excel usually does a fairly good job at this automatically in my experience, however sometimes you do have to adjust it. Your graph should also include error bars, and these error bars should not be percentage uncertainty, as this is almost always wrong. Instead, this should generally be plus or minus one standard deviation for each of your data sets of process data. Next, you also want to include a line of best fit and justify why you chose that specific line of best fit. The type of line of best fit you use is determined by the R squared value. Each line of best fit will have a different R squared value that lies somewhere between 0 and 1. You want to choose the line of best fit that has the value closest to 1, as it means it has a better, closer fit, or more perfect fit. You want to choose the line of best fit with the value closest to 1, even if it does not match your expected results. Basically, the closer it is to 1, the more perfect your fit is. If your line of best fit was a perfect one, it basically means that all of your points every single one, lies exactly on the line of best fit. However, this is basically never the result, as you will always have outliers. So again, as said, you choose your line of best fit with the highest R squared value. As you can see here, the line of best fit with the highest R squared value for me was linear and had an R squared value of 0.8661. At this level of biology research, it is frequent that people have R squared values much, much lower than 0.8 due to a variety of factors, including biological variation and lack of high quality equipment. So don't worry too much if your R squared value value is something like 0.6 or so. That is something you can discuss in your evaluation and analysis, and it's actually quite a good evaluation point if you make use of it. You should in any case also present the equation of your graph and the R squared value itself. Also somewhere below the graph, shortly justify why you chose that line of best fit and type of graph. As you can see, I wrote after examining several lines of best fit, the linear one was ultimately chosen as it had the R squared value closest to 1, in brackets 0.8661. A scatter plot was chosen as the data is continuous. Maybe don't copy my exact phrasing, but you should write something along those lines and also just make sure that your font size for all of these axes are legible. With this, we are probably talking 10.5 and above. You ideally want something at least size 11. In general, teachers say your graph should be half of a page, and generally speaking, I would stick to that unless you are super, super, super desperate for space. But I really would not recommend making it smaller than about one third of a page because you will lose communication with marks for that. You should also have a key for your graph and should mention somewhere that your error bars are plus or minus one standard deviation. In my in my case, I placed the key below the graph right here, however, depending on your graph, you may be able to squeeze it in somewhere else. Oh, also, um, don't forget a clear and descriptive title for your graph that includes your independent variable and dependent variable. Moving on, we have statistical analysis. Technically, this is not required, however, I would very strongly recommend that you do this, as it will aid in scoring highly on evaluation and will help you evaluate your data better, and also help you to draw logical conclusions that are actually founded on data you gathered. Many students would conclude things that you technically can't conclude without a statistical analysis. So to be safe, I would definitely recommend you do this. And I think it's fair to infer from the statement that the IB definitely prefers it. There are a few different types of statistical analyses you can do, including the Pearson's correlation coefficient, t-test, and the ANOVA test. Note that you have to choose the appropriate one for your data, and not all tests will work on each data set. Also, just for reference, a sample larger than 30 is considered a large sample. 15 to 30 is a small sample, and 5 to 15 is a very small sample. Less than 5 is usually considered too small a sample to apply any sort of t-test. You also need to include sufficient explanation for your processing to be followed according to the IB. This does not mean you should include a screenshot of all of the results of your ANOVA test, but you should include a short explanation of the type of test you did, the data you performed the test on, either the raw or process data, and a summary of the results of your test. Again, please don't play dry as but if you do an ANOVA test, that could look something like this. A single factor 2 key HSD ANOVA test was performed on the 0 to 100% lemon juice concentrations using Excel. The p-value found was 4 4.04 times 10 to the negative 29 with an F critical value of 2.007792. This p-value is much smaller than 0.05, indicating that there is a large significant difference in the E. coli growth inhibition zones elicited with varying lemon juice concentrations. Thus, despite error bars overlapping, the data is quite reliable and the null hypothesis is rejected. If you do an ANOVA test like I did, what you have to include is the overall p-value, the F critical value, and whether or not the null hypothesis is rejected. Next, we have data analysis. I would start the section 
by first restating your hypothesis. This is probably the only thing that I would recommend repeating throughout your entire lab. And the reason for that is because by restating your hypothesis, you avoid your examiner having to flip back a bunch of pages to the front of your lab report, which will often automatically result in you losing a mark for communications, which you don't want. <laughs> After this, you basically summarize your observed results. This should include references to the general trend illustrated by your graph, your error bars, the type of correlation or lack of correlation if there isn't one, and a reference to whether your results are in concordance with your hypothesis or not, and whether or not your data is reliable. After this, you should go into more depth about interesting things you noticed, which could, for example, include slight deviations from your hypothesis, as it did in my case, or alternative things. What you include here really depends on your own experiment, but you should probably be referencing to your qualitative data throughout this section as well. You will also have to reference your uncertainties and really make sure you appreciate the scope of your uncertainties and the impact that they could have had on your results. As the Ivy stated in one of their subject reports, basic measurement uncertainties were presented but not discussed. Candidates are expected to appreciate the limitations of their instruments and where they may have the choice to select the appropriate one. In biology, the biggest issue for uncertainties is in the variation in biological material, expressed as standard deviations, standard error, or max min range. Error bars showing variation were frequently used on graphs, but their significance or even what they represented was often absent. In some cases, the error bars were incorrectly placed as they had no bearing on what had been calculated. Note that this was in reference to the evaluation and analysis section. It is not enough to simply state results and uncertainties. You have to actually interpret and explain them. And that means you should have a full understanding of what you're actually looking at, which I know is kind of what a lot of people struggle with. But honestly, a lot of research and a lot of reading up on other research will help you for this. Moving on to outliers. Note that outliers are still counted towards evaluation, but for clarity, I would again recommend making this a subsection. Your statistical analysis should show what specific trials were outliers, and you then have to explain why that may be the case. As with the data analysis, you should likely refer to your qualitative data, because if you have quality observations, you will often notice that the flaws you observed earlier are likely responsible for the outliers. For example, me spilling some lemon juice outside of my wells during my experiment obviously totally impacted my results. And things like that, that might be little accidents, but they're relevant to explain in your analysis and evaluation. Moving on to the conclusion. Here you have to refer back to your research question and conclude something that is fully founded on statistical analysis. For example, I could not have said that my results showed a statistically significant correlation if I had not done the ANOVA test, which is again why I really recommend that you do such a statistical analysis. Also note that you can never ever accept a hypothesis. You can only reject a hypothesis or support one. Also, don't be super optimistic with your results. If your results don't show a correlation, that is okay. All you have to do is explain why that could have been and say that further research is required. Often this is actually the case for research done at school laboratories because really we often don't have the equipment to do high quality research and as a result we don't really produce any significant correlations and that is completely fine. You just need to understand that and understand why your data does not have any correlation. At this point you should also refer back to the scientific context which is often linked to things you discussed in your background information. Though I would argue my reference back to the scientific context was a little limited and may have been the cause of the point I lost on my IA, you can see here that I say things that link the conclusion and the results with a broader scientific context. For example, here I say, research has shown acidic pH is an inhibiting factor of bacterial growth. The H plus ions in the citric acid of the lemon juice concentrations may bind to the negatively charged regions on or around the active sites of enzymes. These interactions may denature enzymes required for important metabolic processes necessary for E. coli survival and consequently inhibit their growth or kill them, thus creating the visible growth inhibition zones. After the conclusion, you have your evaluation and improvement section. First, you state your strength. These should be in prose format, and subsequently you note your limitations, which should be in a table format. Your strengths and limitations really do depend on the individual experiments, but a few common strengths are the wide range of data collected and affordable materials. Some common limitations are biological variation and limited trials. For your table of limitations, you should format it something like this, where you state the limitation, talk about the impact of the limitation, and then state state how you could improve it. I do believe I read something about there being a difference between limitations and weaknesses, but I couldn't find what exactly it was, and to be honest, I don't think it will make a huge difference if you called this the table of limitations or the table of weaknesses. If someone knows what the difference is or is interested in researching what the difference is, then maybe comment that down below. That would be helpful for everyone else. Like with your control variables, for the limitations, I would encourage you to name more than are officially required, since if the IB says some of your limitations aren't valid, you can still score full marks. If one or two of them are not considered valid. Note that most of these limitations you should have already referred to in your evaluation and conclusion. You should also mention if your error was systematic or random. I honestly sucked at telling
telling the difference between these two. So I really encourage you to read up about the difference, but my understanding is that a random error can be balanced out by an increased number of trials, whereas a systematic error will always remain no matter how often you measure something. For example, if you measure something with an imprecise tool, your results will always be imprecise no matter how often you measure it unless you change your tool to something that is more precise. In contrast with random errors such as human rate of reaction, if you measure something five times, a minor change in your rate of reaction will have a large impact, whereas if you measure something a hundred times, chances are that sometimes you will react faster and sometimes you will react slower. So overall, the error will balance out and influence the results less if that makes any sense. Again, I'm not that great at this though, so really do read up on this on your own. Future suggestions and implications to the wider world. As the title of the section states, these are suggestions of future research and implications of such research to the wider world. I know, great description. Note that your suggestions for future research should be somehow connected to your own research. For example, since I investigated lemons, I suggested investigating other citrus fruits and comparing that to lemons. But if you were investigating, I don't know, the effect of varying sunlight exposure on a specific plant or something, it would generally speaking make very little sense for you to suggest that next you would like to investigate the effect of changing temperature on the enzyme activity of peptidase or something like that. I know this seems like an extreme example, but you kind of get the point here. Basically, it just has to be linked to your actual research question in a relatively close manner. After this, you only have to mention your work cited and you're good. Yay! <laughs> this is basically the end, but before finishing this video, I just have a few things I want to mention regarding communications that didn't fit into other parts of these videos. And by the way, all of these were mentioned as common mistakes on past IB subject reports, and often repeatedly on different subject reports. So really pay attention to these. Basically, they stated the most common problems in the works were the use of whole pages for titles, which is not necessary, whole pages for a list of contents, which also isn't necessary, blank data tables presented at the end of the method section, which I would presume is the result of running out of time and forgetting to delete things, repetitive tables, as in using the same table twice in different sections of your lab report, which is not necessary, tables split over two pages or with a title on one page and the table or graph on the next. There would generally recommend that you really try to cram your table onto one page. Sometimes things happen and you have to split them across two pages, in which case to avoid losing communications marks, you have to retitle each of the columns on your table. So for example, with the limitations, impact of limitations, and suggested improvements table, if my table had split, I would have to write the limitations, impact of limitations, suggested improvements, all on the next page as well so that I don't need to flip back to the previous section to realize what I'm actually reading. Then they also mentioned multiple graphs drawn when they could have been combined. This not only saves space but it also improves comparisons. Squashed graphs so the distribution of data is difficult to judge which is what I was saying about using half a page or at the bare minimum a third of a page. Bibliography footnotes, endnotes, or in-text citations missing. References with an incomplete format. Inefficient data table headers which is what I was talking about with making a very descriptive title. And they also mentioned scientific nomenclature was not always used and the formats were not always respected. Units were also occasionally missing and the use of non-metric units did occur sporadically, which means you should definitely always stay in things like millimeters, centimeters, meters, things like that. Obviously the metric system. Finally, they also mentioned the number of decimal places were sometimes irregular or they did not correspond to the precision of the data. What this basically means is that in any data table, you want to measure the same number of decimal places. So if you had one result that's 0.91 and another result that's 0.8, you would write that as 0.91 and 0.80 so that you have two decimal places for each of them. That makes sense. Okay, so that was pretty much the end of this video. If you have any further questions, feel free to write them below and I will try and answer all of your questions. As said, I am not a teacher, so I can't promise you that I will be able to answer all of your questions. However, I will do my best and help you guys if I can. You guys can all do this. I believe in you. Don't plagiarize anything, guys. And I will be linking several resources below as well. I really hope this video helped you in some capacity. And if it did, you know, like and subscribe maybe, or you can always check out some fashion videos if you are interested in checking those out. If you don't feel like doing that, that's okay too. And have an awesome day anyways, guys. Goodbye!